Now that we've gone through a bit of the theory about how the nitrous is actually working once it makes its way all the way into the engine, we still need to activate our solenoids and get the stuff in there safely in the first place. And for that, we're gonna need an engine management system that's got a nitrous control strategy. For a single stage of advanced nitrous control, something like the Elite 750 and Elite 950, Elite 1000 series and Elite 2000 series. They all do one stage of advanced nitrous control. The VMS, this is the one that's the ignition only controller for those cars that are mechanically injected or carbureted. So a lot of the big race cars does up to six stages of advanced nitrous control. The Elite 1500 and 2500 series, as well as the Haltech Nexus ECU, all have six stages of advanced nitrous control. Now let's take a look through the software. We'll go through every single setting in order to make sure that you know exactly how to set up your nitrous control strategy. Uh, keep in mind, I'm using an Elite 2500 series ECU that does have six stages of nitrous. We're just gonna go through one stage because going through and setting up the second stage and the third stage and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth, all uses exactly the same principles as setting up the first stage. We'll click through here into the main setup, functions, into our little nitrous folder. We're gonna start by turning on our first stage of nitrous, and then we'll come back to all of our overrides and enablers as we get through it in the main setup. First thing we need to do, wiring. Choose an output that's gonna control that solenoid the solenoid's gonna draw quite a few amps, so we need to make sure we're using the right output that can drive the solenoid directly. So typically one of our, our green output wires that'll pull two to four amps, something like that on the nitrous solenoid will be fine. If you're using one of the low current outputs, wouldn't be a bad idea to put a relay on it that are supplied in most of the nitrous kits. The first little button that we've got here, fuel solenoid control output, the frequency that it pulses at. So this is to do with our progressive style controller. So at what frequency we're gonna pulse that solenoid in order to get control over the flow of the solenoid versus the duty cycle. We'll flick that off because in this situation we're gonna be setting it up as a solid kit and we're not gonna be using any style of progressive control. If we flick across to settings, again, we'll have a quick look through the progressive controller. So the frequency, as well as the timer mode. What this does, we've got resume, hold, or reset. When the driver drops out of the enabling conditions, this is asking us what we want the nitrous control strategy to do based on that timer. So if we come off the throttle, the nitrous is gonna turn off. Does the timer keep running? Then when the driver hits back on it, we'll turn the nitrous on further down the timer. Or do we want it to just pause the timer so that when we come back on the throttle, we've got the same amount of nitrous going in as when we came off the throttle? Or do we want the timer to reset? So if you come off the throttle, we'll go back to the zero time in the timer. We'll set this up in a little bit and go through some of the mapping so you can see that. I know that's a little bit confusing to talk about, but when we see it in the tables, it'll be a bit easier. If we go into our general functionality here, activation mode. How do we want the nitrous to turn on and off? Do we want it to turn on based off our race timer, which is configured off say like a clutch or trans brake release. So as soon as we let go of the trans brake or sidestep the clutch, this timer starts counting and that's it, our race time. One, two, three, five seconds into the run, we can turn the nitrous kit on. We might want to turn it on on vehicle speed as the thing goes over hundred Ks an hour or whatever the case, possibly always active, meaning that the nitrous is always activated and as long as you're within the engine's enabling conditions, it's away. This is something for circuit racing so that if you're over a certain throttle position, over a certain manifold pressure or under a certain manifold pressure, hit it and we're ready to go. Same story here where instead of having it off a race time, it might be as simple as as soon as we release the trans brake or the clutch or the launch control switch, the nitrous will turn on immediately. Minimum coolant temperature, pretty self-explanatory. The engine needs to be over 60 degrees in order for the nitrous strategy to start working. Minimum engine running time. The engine needs to be up and running for more than this amount of time before the nitrous strategy will start working. Minimum manifold pressure. 
The idea behind this is we need to have airspeed in the engine in order for the nitrous to go in and not sit around and backfire and blow our intake manifold off. So we typically want the engine to be under a little bit of load before we turn the nitrous on. So something like near close to wide open throttle in our manifold pressure might be negative a couple of inches or negative 2 psi or something like 80 kPa absolute or negative 20 kPa gauge pressure would be about where we'd want to turn the nitrous on. Maximum manifold pressure. If this thing's a turbocharged or supercharged car, you might want to turn, use the nitrous to just bring it on boost or just help it off the line. But then once the supercharger or turbocharger is making more power, you might decide to turn the nitrous off. And in that case, we might want to turn the nitrous off at 10 or 15 pounds of boost pressure and let the other power adder take over. Minimum RPM. Below this RPM, the nitrous output will not activate. Same sort of thing, we need RPM to get our airspeed. If we try and activate our nitrous at 1000 or 1100 RPM or something like that, it's not going to be pretty. So make sure that you activate it at an RPM that we've got good airspeed and, and at least making a little bit of power through the engine first. Maximum RPM, same sort of thing. You might want to bring this down to say 5000 or 6000 RPM or whatever is just after your launch RPM. So you might only want to use this thing either to get a car up on the torque converter or to get it out of the hole. But when it's actually start revving, you might want to turn it off or you might want to keep it on for the whole pass. Let's put it at 10,000 RPM and let it rip. Minimum throttle position. Since the dawn of time, nitrous control strategies have had a little micro switch sitting on the throttle, which is something that was a rudimentary way of making sure that the throttle needs to be over 80% in this example in order for the nitrous to actually activate. Works exactly the same way here. The next one, disable during limiter. When we rev an engine up and bounce it off the rev limiter, it's normally not too much of a problem. If the inlet manifold is full of nitrous and you're bouncing off the rev limiter, it makes a bit more of a problem and you can have backfires and all sorts of disasters. So what we do is enable this function, main rev limit offset 200. If your rev limiter was set to 10,000 RPM, this is going to turn off the nitrous solenoid at 9,800 RPM. That gives us 200 RPM for any nitrous that's in the manifold to go through the engine so that when we bounce it off the rev limiter, there's no nitrous there to backfire. We'll move up here to corrections. Apply overall corrections to bank one and two, one only or two only. This part is pretty amazing. And what happens here is we're talking about our corrections for our ignition timing and our fueling, but also to banking. So this is something we didn't speak about before with this style of inlet manifold, where we can actually fire nitrous on banks as well, which is something that a lot of the big nitrous racers do. And the way that this works is instead of having, let's just say, for example, one 400 horsepower kit that hits the engine all at one time and unsettles the tire and unsettles the car, you can actually put 200 horsepower through one bank and then a tenth of a second later, put 200 horsepower through the other bank. This is a really consistent, almost progressive way to get really, really good results, but without pulsing a solenoid, you simply know that you're putting 200 horsepower in one side, a tenth later, 200 horsepower on the other side. You could end up having two 200 kits on one side, two 200 kits on the other side. So that's what we're talking about here, where do these corrections apply to both banks or bank one only or bank two only? I've ticked the box to pl and apply an ignition correction. You could choose to have no ignition corrections if you like, but if you're feeding nitrous in, you probably should be pulling some timing out. The ignition delay. When we fire the solenoid, it takes a certain amount of time for the nitrous to, or for the solenoid to open, then for the nitrous to get from the solenoid into the cylinder and start burning. If we retard the ignition timing immediately, the engine's going to be retarded for that amount of time. So at the moment, we've got our ignition delay set up at 0.05 seconds. That's the amount of time it takes for the nitrous to get into the engine so that as soon as it gets there, the thing is retarded and everything's great, but it doesn't retard the timing too early and make the engine roll over. 
the ignition off delay is also something that is relatively new and does save engines. On a 100 horsepower kit or something like that, it's not too much of a big deal. But if you're putting 200 or 400 horsepower of nitrous through an engine, you come off the throttle and all of a sudden all your ignition delays go away. Just like there was a, a delay or a time that it took for the nitrous to get from the solenoid into the engine, there's also a delay in the, nitri in the engine using the nitrous that's in the manifold and in the lines. So if you disable the nitrous altogether, the solenoid turns off. If you put the ignition timing straight back into the engine, you'll over advance it and the thing will detonate. So our ignition off delay, I normally set it to a really big number of one second. In a drag racing application, when you come off the throttle, that's fine to be retarded there anyway. What this does is it retards the ignition timing and gives it one second to purge all the nitrous through the engine and out before it returns to normal ignition timing. The fuel correction, our fuel delay and our fuel off delay, exactly the same sort of principle as our ignition and our ignition off delay. Only difference here, the fuel off delay, on one hand, yes, it keeps the fuel there so that the, the engine's got the right mixture when all the nitrous is in there. If you make that fuel off delay, instead of one second, which is reasonable, if you make that two or three seconds, for example, you'll get a whole heap of extra fuel through the engine on that back off when the engine's nice and hot and it'll throw a really nice flame. So that's also pretty good to look at. Our next two little tabs down the bottom here, cylinder ignition corrections. So these are the ones when this nitrous kit hits, you might actually be favoring individual cylinders. So you got, might get more or less flow to particular cylinders or you might know that your engine has a bit of an imbalance thing going on so you know which cylinders are favored. You can go through and do individual cylinder corrections for the ignition timing when the nitrous hits. The last one, our target AFR correction. This is where things get just a little bit confusing because we've already talked about adding more fuel through the EFI fuel injectors in order to put more fuel in for the nitrous system. But what we're actually doing there is putting more fuel in in order to achieve the same target air fuel ratio as when the thing did not have the nitrous in it. So if we were targeting, let's say 12 o mixtures, for example, in petrol scale, we shoot a whole bunch of nitrous into it with no corrections at all. The thing would lean out to 13s, 14s, 15 to one, or whatever the case. We then use all of our fuel corrections in the nitrous strategy to add fuel through the fuel injectors, we're talking about a dry kit, to get back to our 12 to one air to fuel ratio. This is not adding any more safety into the tune because we've now got nitrous and more power in the engine. The target AFR correction, however, does exactly that. We've added the fuel in, so the engine is now back to our target of 12 to one. Then our target AFR correction, if we might want to put in, uh, say, minus one, for example. So instead of being at 12 to one, the engine will now be targeting 11 to one when the nitrous is turned on. This adds our extra safety for the nitrous and it enriches the mixture more to keep control over the temperatures in cylinder when we're making more horsepower. Now we'll do a bit of clicking around and have a look at the override settings and the enable settings. These are a bunch of inputs that go into the ECU, so we'll go through them step by step. Um, if you're not following it here on the screen or you can't see what's going on too well, Keep in mind, you can download the Haltech ESP software for free straight off our website. It's a full working version. Download the software, install it, go File, New, choose Elite 2500. You can go through and click on all this stuff and sort of make up all your own base maps as well and sort of see how everything works. So I'm gonna start at the top here, Override Settings. So I'm gonna go up to Nitrous, Overrides. Now what happens here is as long as we're within all of our safety enabling conditions, basically what this is, is our go baby go button. So as long as the engine's been running for more than five seconds, we're over 80% throttle, we're over two and a half thousand RPM, we can press this button and it's gonna override all of our other timer strategies. So if a racer takes off, everything's going great and he gets bored or something happens where he knows the car can take the power of that nitrous hit, but the programming wasn't there for it, he can simply press the button, override all the other conditions, and it'll take off. Enablers. 
I feel like nitrous is a bit of an enabler sometimes for all of that extra power that we want. Nitrous enable is that switch that we have on the dash that in a lot of racing forms you need the blue light that turns on to let us know that the nitrous is active. You often need the blue sticker, the triangle sticker in the window that's the N2O sticker just to let crews know that there is nitrous on board. The nitrous enable switch should be wired into that blue light. And all this does is if that switch is turned off, no nitrous system is active, nothing is going to enable, nothing's gonna happen. We flick this switch on, the blue light on the dash turns on, and then all of our nitrous strategies are there and start working. We do have four nitrous enable switches. We do have four nitrous override switches to work across six stages of nitrous. The purpose of having that many enable conditions and that many nitrous stages, we don't expect that many people to have six stages on their car. However, we do expect quite a lot of people to have three split stages. So like I spoke before, the banked nitrous setups, six kits is actually three banked kits, which is a fairly common thing to do. So if you're thinking, why would they run six kits or why is there only four enable conditions for six kits? Well, you kind of only really need three enable conditions for six kits. One of the other things that we've got here, our nitrous pressure input sensor. So like we spoke about before, nitrous pressure is related to the bottle temperature. It changes dramatically, really important to get a hold of because as we all know, if we change pressure, we change flow. If we change flow, we change the amount of power that the engine's gonna make, which in turn changes the amount of fueling and ignition timing that we're gonna need to change on the engine. If we've got a nitrous pressure sensor, we can then display that on our dash, first of all. That's awesome. We can data log it so we can see what the nitrous is actually doing throughout the run to make sure the bottle pressure's not rolling over and we're running out or anything like that. But most importantly, we can use a bottle warmer to always regulate the temperature of the bottle to whichever pressure you want to run it at. So let's say it was 950 PSI, for example. We can set up the bottle warmer to turn on and off to regulate the bottle pressure at 950 PSI. So let's get out of the main setup page and we'll go into the tuning screen down the side here. So you'll see I've got nitrous controller one. First off, our overall ignition correction. So in here, typically we would pull out something like about two degrees per 50 horsepower, best to speak to your tuner, but rule of thumb, that seems about right. So for this, we're gonna be doing, we'll just say that we've got a 100 horsepower kit. So if I pulled out four degrees of ignition timing across all bottle pressures, but we know that, I'm just gonna put a bit of a shape in here so you get the idea of what it should look like. If we're at 600 pounds of bottle pressure, extremely low and the thing, it won't work there anyway, so nothing's gonna happen, but it will be less horsepower there. If it was at huge bottle pressure, we're gonna get more nitrous flow, so there would be more power across the same jet. So let's say we were there, pull out five degrees of ignition timing, we'll make that linear. And in the end, at our working bottle pressure of around 950 PSI, we'd be pulling out negative 4.4 degrees out of the total engine. So in sort of dizzy terms or distributor terms, this would be like retarding the distributor 4.4 degrees every time the nitrous hits. Cylinder ignition correction is the next one. All zeros, but if you know there's one cylinder that keeps getting a, a hurt spark plug or cracks a ringland, or you know that there's something going on there, we might say, all right, that's cylinder seven, and we might pull one degree out of that cylinder, for example. We can go through that and do that for four cylinder, six cylinder, eight cylinder, whatever the case. The next one, overall fuel correction. This is the one that's gonna make it or break it. This table is one of the most important ones, and what it's doing, is compensating for the nitrous going into the engine, we need to then add fuel through the fuel injectors in order to get back to our desired target air to fuel ratio. So at our target bottle pressure of let's say 950 PSI, I've chosen here to add about 50 pounds per hour more fuel in order for the engine to then achieve the original target air to fuel ratio. Uh, the reason why I'm using pounds per hour is because in the sort of nitrous world, that's a really common um, way of measuring how much fuel is going in. Um, in all of the online calculators and all that sort of stuff, it'll normally tell you, okay, there's a nitrous jet that is X thousandths of an inch 
in diameter, that means that you would need X pounds per hour of fuel to go in. So we make it nice and simple so that if you know that you used to run a full mechanical injection and you had this size nitrous pill and you used a pill that had 20, 40, 60, 80, 100 pounds of fuel, you can just type the same number in and you're away. Our target AFR correction. This is the safety one. So if this thing ran aspirated at our air to fuel ratio of 12 to one, our petrol air to fuel ratio of 12 to one, like we spoke about before, if I highlight this whole table and be very careful with this, be, pay attention to the positive and negative numbers. If I go minus one in this whole table, when the nitrous hits, instead of targeting 12 to one, it'll now be targeting 11 to one. So this is not adding the extra fuel for the nitrous like we spoke. I know we went over this, I just want to be very clear about it. This is not adding the fuel for the nitrous hit. This is building in more safety into the engine. So instead of running at our aspirated mixture of 12 to 1, we're now running at our power adder mixture of 11 to 1. Next one, stage 1 controller activation. This one's pretty straightforward two seconds sitting in there. This is because we set it up off race timer originally. So what this would mean, once the race timer starts, so off the release of our trans brake or clutch switch or foot brake or however you're doing it, once the race timer hits two seconds, that's when the nitrous will activate. I might go one second, I might go 0 0.1 seconds. So we release the button, the car just starts to take off, the gas hits and she's away. We've covered how the race timer works in a different video. So we'll put the link here so you can have a bit of a look. Uh, explains exactly what the race timer does. It's super useful for controlling nitrous strategies, um, even doing things like fuel and ignition corrections based on the race timer. Uh, certainly helped me a lot at the racetrack and that's a little trick to be able to just focus on making small power changes to the car without changing the whole fuel or ignition map. So check out the link, worth having a look. N2O. Nitrous oxide solenoid duty cycle. This is what I was speaking about before about our progressive timer. So what we've got happening here is that when we're sitting on the line at zero seconds, we're pulsing that solenoid at zero duty cycle. So there's no duty cycle, there's no frequency. One second into the run, the thing's pulsing at 50% duty cycle. So it's providing half the flow of what the solenoid can handle. At two seconds, 100% so it's flat out and it's as if it's just turned on the whole time. Doing a progressive style kit is often a really nice thing if you're racing in a class that only allows say for one kit of nitrous, you might choose to put one solenoid that's capable of flowing 400 or 500 horsepower to the whole engine. If you hit that and the thing, the, the engines goes from 500 horsepower to 1000 horsepower instantly, you have a, it's a really tricky thing to get the car to hook up and go. Whereas if you pulse it in over time, you might end up pulsing it in and having 100 horsepower for a tenth of a second, then 200 horsepower, then 300 horsepower, then four, 500 horsepower over half a second or a second. This way it makes the power much more manageable and much more consistent. Well guys, we've come to the end of the episode. We've gone through the theory of how it works. We've gone through all the engine management stuff of how to set it up. We were lucky enough that we could go and buy a whole bunch of the nuts and bolts to see all the individual components and what we're actually gonna need for it. I did end up with a full nitrous kit sitting here. Now only there was a car to fit it to. 